Well, according to the United Nations, around about 3 million people, that is one in 10 of the population, have fled from Venezuela because of the complete mess the country has been in since 2015. With the rate of migration increasing and no end to that mass exodus in the country, what future do Venezuelans have? Very good to have your company. You're watching Round Table. I'm David Foster. Now, insecurity, instability and violence, just three of the myriad reasons why millions have decided to leave the country of their birth, Venezuela. Figures now showing that 10 per cent of the population, one in ten, have decided to quit. That has created chaos and an overwhelming humanitarian crisis in neighbouring countries. How will Venezuela survive? Hyperinflation, medicine and food shortages are driving millions of Venezuelans out of the country. It's one of the largest mass displacements in the history of Latin America. According to the UN, around 3 million people have fled the political and economic crisis since 2015. People are leaving to neighbouring countries in order to survive, with numbers expected to rise and no end to the crisis. What does this mean for the future of the nation? Let us start the conversation. Please to say that joining us via Skype, we have from Rio Acha in Colombia, the freelance journalist Dylan Badur. In London, Diego Moya Ocampos, who's from IHS Market in the Americas team, covering the political, security and business environment. With me in the studio, we have Paddy Dowling, photojournalist who's recently come back from Venezuela and, and neighbouring countries. His work appearing in The Independent. And Carlos de Sousa, senior economist working in the Latin America team at Oxford Economics. Um, now, I know Carlos and you, Diego, are going to cover the sort of the, the political state, but let's talk about the humanitarian side of things first. Uh, Dylan, you are up there on the, the Caribbean coast, pretty close to the border uh, with Venezuela. You are actually, I believe, in, in Colombia. Um, and this is because an American hospital ship has arrived. That's correct. Uh, Colombia has long struggled with this problem of um, thousands and tens of thousands and now getting into hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans crossing the border, and one of these reasons is because they have uh, an entirely collapsed healthcare system. So uh, people suffering from what previously were minor health complications now find themselves facing life-threatening uh, conditions and, and are leaving the country consequently. Uh, Colombia can't take it. They don't have the public funds to provide treatment to this many uh, people who can't, can't pay on their own, so this American ship is coming to to provide a little bit of assistance on that front. And what sort of numbers are we talking about? Because I don't know whether the ship's big enough to treat everybody on board or, or whether, in fact, um, the medics and other people have to come to the shore. There are several hundred people uh, being treated, not all of them Venezuelan, also, also members of the local community. Um, the ship will perform several dozen surgeries per day on board the ship. Um, but minor treatments will be performed on shore. And for Venezuelans, this can be something as simple as, as getting a, um, a bad tooth removed, which is a service that you can't find professionally done uh, in Venezuela many times. Yeah, but that it is indicative of the state of the place, isn't it? I want you to tell me in a little while about, about what you've seen around the border areas, but that's something that you've seen. Paddy, which, which country is bordering with Venezuela? So I was... Uh, um based in Ecuador with Care International's um, Ecuador office and I was down on the Peruvian border uh, in Huaquillas and then up towards the north uh, covering Romichaca crossing point but also in Colombia itself at uh, Cucuta, the main busy crossing point and the, 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 the kind of quieter crossing point of Arauca. You saw people clearly. Mm, many, many people. Were yeah. there types of people? In other words, were they mostly women and children, men of not working age or what? There was a huge demographic, uh, and I'm sure Carlos will get into this um, slightly later. Uh, I think uh, this crisis saw a couple of years ago the work, you know, the more professionals leave Venezuela, and now this is the backbone working class of the country that are coming through. And um, there were the elderly, the young. Um, many have made the journey, uh, you know, 20 days walking through Colombia. They call them the walkers. Um, you know, the soles of their shoes worn through, blisters on their feet, um, but such a range. There were lots and lots of women that arrived on their own, having left their 
young children of ages of two or three years old back home in Venezuela with parents. Um, and that, of course, you know, causes more, more problems. Well, because I think one, of the, one part of your story is that um, you, you discover that mm. so many of these women were being exploited as sex workers and were being trafficked. Yeah, this is an enormous, uh, an enormous, enormous problem. I found it very upsetting, actually. Um, there were many women who were tricked and coerced into uh, working in the industry. And, you know, in certainly places like Arauca, uh, I saw girls as young as 13 or 14 on street corners. And it seemed that everyone was taking their, you know, their cut in this crisis. It was taxi drivers who were taking uh, young girls to, you know, a, a, you know, below the age of consent to, um, you know, executives and oil companies. Uh, there were um, hotel concierges, you know, filling uh, girls, you know, days with appointments with clients and hotels. And it just seemed so just kind of commonplace. Yeah, and, and one of the saddest office. things um, I understand is, is the fact that they were considered better because they were cheaper, because they were much yeah. more desperate for the money yeah. than yeah, they, the they, natives of that particular. You're absolutely right, David. That, I mean, oh. a, third, a third of the price, you know. And so what it's done is it's, it's, it's created an enormous uh, market for prostitution in, in some parts. Uh, these girls are there more often than not without papers. Uh, brothel owners um, hide them when immigration come calling and knocking on the door. Um, and they get very, very exploited. Uh, but there are, some, there are some glimmers of hope in some, some pockets. Well, let's get on to yeah. that a little bit later, because yeah. it would be nice to hear, yeah, hear that. Why are these people so desperate to leave? They must be frightened of something. Definitely. Uh, so that, that's one factor, is definitely security. Uh, that's been a long-standing negative factor in Venezuela. It's not new. Venezuela has always been a dangerous country. But as it became more and more lawless, uh, it became extremely, extremely dangerous. So that's one factor that definitely drove like a first wave of Venezuelans, of all the professionals who could leave easily uh, or relatively, with relative ease, the country. Uh, but then, um, as mentioned before, healthcare is a, is a very important reason to leave. Not only because the, the whole public sector healthcare is completely collapsed, partly because all the doctors have left the country years ago, uh, but also because it's very difficult to find any medicines. So people die of very simple diseases that could be easily treated elsewhere. Diego, bear with us just a second. We will come to you in a moment. What, what are you seeing that really sticks in your mind? So I, I've seen the demographic of the, the migrants change a little bit in recent months. Uh, months ago, it was primarily young men, um, not entirely, but, but who were sent by their families to go uh, migrate, make an income to send home, um, and eventually bring their families along. But now, uh, along these highways where people are walking, we're finding increasing um, women and children, families, older people. Um, so I find um, young mothers holding two children's in hand, walking down um, a highway, you know, with with a five to ten days walk ahead of them, um, kind of coming into tears as night falls, wondering how they're going to sleep in these cold mountain places. and. And eventually what you find is families huddled together in the nooks of buildings in the, in the highlands here, uh, trying to sleep through the cold. Um, most of the people eat only what they're offered by charitable people along the way in this migration. Um, and they beg for, uh, for, you know, a few coins to, wow. to get very basic stuff. Well, th this is a country that could be amongst uh, the richest in, in South America. And it was. And it, and it was. So Diego, what kind of hellhole and how have the last two presidents of Venezuela turned this beautiful place into? Well, basically, it has been a result of epic mismanagement and widespread corruption. And in this drama, uh, the military has played a key role because we have a country where while the military and the security apparatus continue supporting Maduro in power, we're going to continue uh, seeing, you know, that regime change will continue being highly unlikely. And this is very important because the same people who has the responsibility to contain social unrest as a result of hyperinflation, as a result of shortages of food and basic goods, is the same people who are running the economy, who are in charge of professional services, illegal mining, fuel smuggling, some of them are involved in drug trafficking, and this is basically the key dilemma. While the military continues supporting Maduro, then the possibility of regime change, the possibility of free and fair elections allowing Venezuelans to decide 
the future will remain highly unlikely into 2019. Because these military men, they're, they're not just um, soldiers, they're not just wielding guns and giving orders on the battlefield. These are people who control um, the, the taps that turn on or off the economy. They control the ports, they control big business, they control farming, factories, etc., etc. Very much like Egypt, in a sense, where the, where the military there are effectively the richest people in, in the country. So no way is it in their interest to see the end of Maduro, are you saying? Absolutely. And this is uh, through this very complex patronage system. Some of these, not all the military, there are some still st institutional factions, but these do not have power of command. So these military factions, some of these, the ones which are profiteering from this situation, are the ones which import food and basic goods, so they do not have any incentive for you know, the shortages of food and basic goods to, uh, you know, for a solution to come to this. And some of these do fear that if there were to be regime change, they would be held accountable for uh, not only uh, for the issues related with corruption, but also over gross human rights violations in controlling protests in, in previous years. OK, Dylan and Paddy, I'm going to come to you in just a moment to talk about the situation you found in the neighbouring countries. But, Carlos, let me put this to you, because, as Diego say, there doesn't seem to be much likelihood of regime change, and yet we have President Trump not so very long ago at the UN General Assembly saying it's a regime that, frankly, could be toppled very quickly by the military if the military decides to do that. What yeah. is going to make the well, military change its mind or position. Yes, yeah, so, so a very important factor is that not everyone within the military is happy about the current regime. And there are plenty of people in the military who are very dissatisfied with the regime. Uh, but all of the military personnel is being surveilled by the government. Uh, not only with some government organizations that surveil old communications of the military at all levels, uh, and also with the help of the Cuban military uh, intelligence. So this gets quite complicated. So there is. So the Cuban military intelligence is very much on the side of Nicolas Maduro, as yes. it was uh, with Hugo Chavez, who had a great relationship with of both course. of the two Castros. So they are working as a, an outside agent to spy on the Venezuelan military on behalf of the ruler. Yes. That, 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 that's basically the situation. Yeah. So um, even though there, there is a group who wishes to, you know, to just have a coup, and there, is, there was even a group of milita high military personnel who went to the United States to try to negotiate how to do it, um, they, they were rejected in the first place. And many this of them... was under Trump? Yeah. Or, not, or were under... Open. No, under Trump. Okay. Um, and many others fear that if they, you know, if, if their surveillance agents see them conspiring, they will imprison them or kill them and so on. So I, I think I agree uh, fully that the, the, the chances of regime change are quite low at the moment. Um, but the, the only way out I see is through an internal coup. So what, and, what, what and, about and sanctions? Are they going to make people so dissatisfied, the military so dissatisfied? Because we've just had some more sanctions and there will be more after that. Um, are those sanctions in any way squeezing um, the right people so well, that they hurt and they say enough of this? I think sanctions act, you know, big sanctions on individuals. So we have to be explicit about what kind of sanctions they, they, the U.S. is imposing on specific individuals. And the threat of I will impose sanctions on you will move you to go to the U.S. and cooperate with them and reveal information so that other people can be indicted for several different sorts of crimes. For example, it, it's interesting that last week uh, the CEO of a TV channel that was purchased by the government a few years ago uh, was indicted guilty of um, embezzlement and corruption and, 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 and a bunch of and, and money laundering and a bunch of charges. Uh, this person knows what everyone's doing, basically. He knows where he, the bodies are buried, as they say. Exactly. In so, so the government is actually quite scared that this guy is okay. going to talk uh, in the U.S. Uh, so, so, I mean, there are a lot of pieces moving on. I completely agree with the outlook. I think regime change is quite unlikely at the moment. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised is if at, at some point, in, it could be very soon, there, there is some instability. Dylan, uh, Paddy, I'm not change. ignoring you, but I want to get the economics mm -hmm. of this sorted out and the stability of the country. So, Diego, back to you. Uh, there's a guy who was chief economist at Torino Capital, former head of the Venezuelan Congressional Budget Office. You may know his name, Francisco Rodriguez. And yep. he is anti-Maduro. Now, he said this, he wrote this 
uh, very recently, the United States and the anti-Maduro opposition will not win the hearts and minds of Venezuelans by helping drive the country's economy into the ground. So the sanctions, he says, are counterproductive, Diego. They're designed to sort of hurt the reputation of Nicolas Maduro. They're doing the exact opposite. They're getting the people on his side. Uh, I mean, they have proven not to be very effective, but as Carlos was referring, they changed the system of uh, incentive. So far, it seems they have not uh, changed behavior within the armed forces. I mean, these have not forced the armed forces to withdraw support for Maduro. But the main reason for this is, as Carlos was referring, it's a much, uh, it's an institution which is under strong uh, surveillance. There have been some efforts within the armed forces to try to generate a debate over continued support in Odol Maduro. There are more than 200 officers arrested um, as we speak. But in general terms, it seems that sanctions are not enough. And within the armed forces, the dynamics is that they have more incentives to desert or to be distant from the high military command than to stage or coordinate something against the status quo. The that, that, only thing that seems to be able to change the behavior of the armed forces is sanctions is a factor, it's an important factor. We saw recent sanctions over the gold sector, potentially there could be sanctions on the oil sector. Uh, but it seems that this on its own is not enough. Potentially, protests escalate beyond the capacity of security so forces to contain so what, them. What that I'm wondering, factor. sorry to, sorry to jump in. But I, I want to bring Dylan and Paddy back yeah. in back in here. One one re, one thing that may help bring about change of some kind is outside pressure. Um, and when you look at the pressure that um, yeah. a country such as Colombia, uh, Dylan, where you happen to be at the moment, is under anyway as it tries to rebuild its country after a decades-long civil war, as it's encouraging more and more tourists to come to the country, particularly the area up there on the Caribbean coast where you are, it is under enormous pressure to deal with this migrant situation in some particular way, either by stopping it or by helping. So which approach do you see? Uh, Colombia, I have to say, has been very generous um, in its perception of the Venezuelans. Uh, although, on the other hand, they also acknowledge that there's absolutely no way they can stop this. Their border is, is very long through very rural territory and, and absolutely open and controlled largely by, um, by smuggling gangs that smuggle Venezuelan contraband and drugs. So that's out of the question. Uh, they have no choice but to receive the Venezuelans and one of their tactic thus far has been helping as many as they can get through Colombia and on to their destinations across the continent. Uh, Colombia has been practically begging for international aid and has not received nearly as much as they've hoped for. Um, just uh, two weeks ago about in Bogota, the capital, they opened the first large tent tent shelter or tent, tent camp for migrants which they had held off on doing for a long time because that can serve as a magnet and, and leave the government with responsibility for a large population. Um, Colombia is under a lot of pressure from its own citizens also who see these masses of migrants coming and, you know, displacing them in, in low wage labor. And so, so is there cases, any sense that they, the, the population, a disgruntled population um, and, and an embattled and perhaps slightly embittered government would be able to put any other pressure onto the Venezuelans uh, alongside other South American countries as well and sort of that lead to sort of some kind of change in Venezuela or are they helpless? Uh, Colombia has basically no leverage on Venezuela. Uh, Maduro often accuses Colombia of being a destabilizing force in the region, which is quite ironic. Um, and the Colombia's Migration Authority, they told me that they haven't had contact with Venezuelan Migration Authority in um, I, several years, or at least more than a year. There's really no, no dialogue uh, on that front. And, and Venezuela, for its part, denies that this migration is a uh, legitimate phenomenon, and it's kind of a cooked uh, up Paddy, what did you uh, see? Thanks, Dylan. Uh, what, what did you see in your travels re with regards to the other countries, those that are taking so many of these migrants? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, Colombia, I've seen uh, a million uh, Venezuelans pour in across their borders, and I think Peru, half a million, and, and Ecuador have seen 220,000. That's kind of the latest figures from Russia, I think. But 
there's a lot of xenophobic attitudes towards um, to migrants coming in. You have to remember that you know these countries don't have you know swathes of uh, surplus to hand around. You've got migrants coming in and competing for what little resources are there, and uh, so it's putting enormous pressure. One thing I, I would definitely say is that every Venezuelan I had talked to and interviewed said that the Colombians were extremely kind people. They um, they gave a lot. That you know people walking was you know given food and yeah it's a it's a but yeah enormous pressure enormous pressure being put on these countries at the minute. And did you get tales <coughs> of the security problems that the Venezuelans had faced when they were in their own country? Because I'm referring to the fact that I think it's the Peruvian Prime Minister has now mm. suggested that um, the International Criminal Court open an investigation into human rights abuses mm. uh, by the Venezuelan authorities. So did you get a sense that the people there felt physically in danger by staying and, and were being... Um, uh, I, I didn't, David, no. I, I think, to be fair, the only, the only kind of... Um, Stories I heard were stories of you know families struggling with being able to put food on the table. This is the you know the, the real main problem is you know, fam you know mo mothers and fathers were taking it in turn of drawing straws who would eat that day uh, to feed their children. You know children are, are eating from rubbish bins. This is not something that is a tale. I've seen it myself. You know family of mother and father and two children on their hands and knees eating like dogs out of rubbish bins. It is a really distressing thing to see. So they are. They are leaving to save themselves, and they are locking the houses, locking the doors on their houses for maybe the last time. Um, but they're desperate. They're absolutely desperate. They have no other alternatives. And um, you know, lots of young males of the age of you know, 18 to kind of mid 20s, just marching down the road on their own through Colombia uh, for a better life to be able to send some money back home. And at the moment, it probably is a slightly better life, but it's not not a particularly good life. Uh, the security situation inside Venezuela is deteriorating. The Peruvian Prime Minister is saying, listen, we've got to take this to the International Criminal yeah. Court. What is going on really? So what, what he wants to take to the International Criminal Court are actually crimes against opposition members. So there is mainly political persecution. Uh, a lot of political uh, people from the opposition have been tortured and have been leaving the country because they have been uh, unlawfully in prison, more like kidnapped and torture and kind of forced to flee. But this is obviously not something you would see when you see refugee camps or anything, because it's, it's a very, very small share of population that are politically active and persecuted. The, the, the other side of the uh, security situation uh, is just random crime because it's a completely lawless state. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was one of the main reasons to leave years ago. Now, the, the, the most pressing matter is actually to put food on the table and to have medicines to survive. You are Venezuelan. That's you have correct. members of your family still there. Yeah. I think you said they told me earlier that these were the <clears throat> more elderly members of the family who cannot perhaps travel quite so easily. What kind of situation have they described to you, the pressures that they are under? Those that have left and those that have stayed. Yeah, so I think Venezuelans have learn to live in this constant paranoia and they minimize how much they leave the house where where they go out they just basically just go to work if they still work uh, and they go back and they go for groceries and go back and do everything inside their houses for fear of being in the streets this is the middle class as well that's there was a very wealthy middle class in venezuela 30 that, that's years ago. the middle class the upper class that's basically everyone um, the the other very concerning worsening security situation uh, is, is more international, is related to the ELN, it's a terrorist group from mm -hmm. Colombia, uh, that has started to operate openly in Venezuela and with the regime's consent. Um, so this is, an, this is not the FARC, this is a terrorist group with whom the Colombian government has not actually negotiated peace, or successfully at least. Um, so we have the ELN moving across the border from Colombia to, yes. into Venezuela. We have the collapse of the Col Venezuelan administration. Uh, we have migrants leaving and having to sell themselves for sex because they don't have any money. Do you see any hope in, in the, sh the short term, medium term? In, in the short term, I mean, basically not, to be honest. Um, and if, if we discuss about uh, the sanctions again, uh, of the different kinds of sanctions... We are running out of time at the moment, so well, okay. do keep it quick. Well, uh, it, it is more likely that it gets worse economically, at least, than it gets better. So one thing is that oil production has been collapsing continuously 
and will continue to do so over next years. Oil prices are also much lower now than they were a month before and you also have the possibility that there may be sanctions on the oil sector. So the economic conditions for Venezuelans is much more likely to get worse than to get better. Yeah, and this is something I picked up just before I came in to do the program. Um, we haven't had time to talk about it because it hasn't happened yet, I suppose that's one of the reasons. The Trump administration prepares to add Venezuela to a list of state sponsors of terrorism. It's reserved for governments accused of repeatedly providing, quote, support for acts of international terrorism at the moment, it only includes Iran, North Korea, Sudan and yes. Syria. And we do know the state of those countries and what sanctions um, and the labelling um, as a state sponsor of terror has done to them and to their mostly innocent people. Listen, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank You're you. off to South Sudan, aren't you, fairly soon, Paddy? Yeah. Good luck, you get all the best jobs. Uh, Dylan, fun. thank you very much. Diego, thank you too. Um, and Carlos, we appreciate your time. Every single one of you coming in and talking about this most important topic. Um, thank you for watching. I'm David Foster from me and the team. We appreciate your company. We hope to have it next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>